Thank you, guys. Morning, family. Well, you didn't get far last week. I forgot. Don't you'd want to know. VBS, 61 kids. Okay, 61 children have signed up for VBS. Whoop! Okay. Does volunteers needed mean anything to you guys? <laughs> That's a lot of babies. This place is going to rock. And you, you need to be here and see it work one time. It, it's absolutely perfect as we, uh, as we just enjoy. So, I start again. You didn't get far from last week. We're still in Second Peter. Um, I just couldn't quit it, and I don't think we need to. But it, it dawned on me a couple things, and I want to go over this Second Peter with you in such a way that if I do it right, it'll make perfect sense, and if I don't do it right, give me a chance before you leave to get her undone and start over with you, because this is huge. You see, sometimes, just, and I say out of nowhere, it seems like you and I, you know, we're just minding our own business. We're doing what we're doing. Um, and and you, better, you better be ready to be asked, well, so who is this God? And what, what is this all about? Why do you go to church every Sunday? I mean, the questions is coming, and I told the guys a little story. I'm up in uh, TSC by Jackson there, and I just, I just needed some more steer feed, and so I'm there just, just buying steer feed, right? Just not doing anything spiritual, feeding steers, which has a real good meaning to me because pretty soon, Louie knows what I'm talking about. I'm going to take him to town. But before I get there, I had to finish out a feeding program, and I'm up there, and, and however this happens, you're not thinking a, a, a lot about a lot of things. And uh, the guy rings me up, and, he's, and I give him my phone number, because at TSC you get a prize if you buy $12 million worth of steer feed. You, <laughs> they give you five bucks in return, and you, you just think you really nailed one. And so he says, you're a pastor? And I went, yeah. I mean, I do not look like a pastor on any day, even Sundays, but yeah, I'm a pastor. And he pulls off to the side and he looks at me and he says, do you preach election? And I went, and, and you guys know me as you know me, and the new guys don't, but I looked at him with a little grin on my face and I went, I wanted to say, duh, <laughs> you'd be proud of me, I didn't. I don't even know the guy. His name is Carl. I said, you know why I do, don't you? Because it talks about it in the Bible. And that seemed to satisfy him. Now, out of nowhere, why would he come up with that question? And maybe they don't. But if in the Bible, you're going to get it. Double barrel my style. You'll have to get around the way I say things, but you're going to get it. And, and in fact, you're going to actually see it today again. But when, when, you, when you do that and you're just not thinking about it, somehow, before you say a word, your witness is true. You, 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 sometimes you just don't have to say a word. And I know why. I figured out why. It's not that I am a shining example. When I went to TSC, I was about half filthy. I'd been down the road a little ways that morning already, and needless to say, I wasn't shiny, and needless to say, I didn't look pastoral. I looked like an old bum cowboy that drove up in his flatbed to get some feed is what I looked like. And they love those kind of guys. Cha-ching. I didn't show up to visit. I showed up to consume. So what you do or don't do, I believe, speaks louder than what you say. Now, if they give you a chance, I love to tell them. I love to, I love to say, yes, sir, I speak on election quite frequently because the Bible says it. And, and uh, he, needed to, he needed to hear that for some reason that day. Of all the things you could ask me, um, I, thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of strange, but it wasn't for him. 
But here's the key. Was I ready? And the answer is, I was ready. And I'm not going to say, are you ready? Because I know the answer is, you're ready. And I'll tell you why I know you're ready. Because he who is in you stays ready. And you don't have to be thanking God stuff and, and planning a sermon and, and praying for the brothers and the sisters. You don't have to be doing all that to somebody to come out of the cold and say, do you, do you tell me about this, God? I promise you, you're ready. You just may not see it coming. So when you and I find ourselves in, in what I call a divine appointment, you reckon that was? Who set that up? I'm still trying to figure out how they had me as a pastor in their computer. It doesn't matter, but I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how that came up under my name. And um, it's, it's, so it is. And you know what that was, brethren? That was a divine appointment. That was a preset. All of us were at the right place at the right time, and God says, and he pushed the button. You know how today they say plug and play? We were plugging and playing and got everything done. By the way, I left with the feed, and the steers are happy, and I'm going to get happy. So at the end of the day, it seems to be working. Your homework last week I gave you was a, a to list three things. Sounded simple, didn't it? We were talking about knowledge in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And I asked you a question. I thought it was brilliant. List three things, three, only three, you, know, you can go more, minimum of three things that you know about God. Not that you hope is true, not that you really, really want it to be right. Give me three things that you know, bam. You can say that you believe. When you believe, you know something because you can't believe on something that's all over the place. When you locked it down to a knowing, what they called here in the scripture that we're going to read in a bit of the knowledge. Truth is, family, you and I can only witness to what we know. You ever thought of that? You can't talk about something you don't know. Because you don't know what to say about it. But what you know, you can speak to that level. It's pretty simple. Today is going to be pretty simple, so stay with me. Don't try to outthink me. That's too easy. Just stay with me. What you know, you can put out on the table. You, you, you can tell them that one something. And it doesn't have to be a lot. The day you were saved, you became a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? I don't know, but I got saved. So that would make him the Christ, the Savior. And that's all you knew. Now down the road, you should know a little bit more than that because doesn't faith come by hearing the message and the message is heard through the Word of Christ? We should be growing, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We should be growing. Do you know, do you know that you're saved? I'm not going to play that game with you. Well, yeah, let's play it. <laughs> All right, church, this is your turn. Ready? Are you saved? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Ooh, you guys are getting good. Are you satisfied? Yes. Ooh, that was pitiful. <laughs> there was an old pastor that I knew that did that. And I did what are, you, what are you doing? You don't like to holler out in the middle of a church service, but if you're saved and you know it, you can. You see, that's what you know. Will it take you all the way to your deathbed? I don't mean to be, I don't, I don't mean to drag you backwards on this thing, but I'm going to have the privileged blessing of going to visit Mary Kay this afternoon. Mary, Mary Kay is in hospice care and who knows. 
I can tell you standing in this pulpit right now what I'm going to find. She's sure. She's sure. We've studied together too many years and, and, and prayed together too much for me not to get into her life and know that she knows. Now, Mary Kay can talk about the Lord Jesus and his saving grace because she is. Is that making sense? Okay, because I want you to see something here. I think that maybe the very first truth that you and I have to buckle down is the fact of that knowledge. And, and, and what that'll do when you get that sure knowledge that you are. And I remember in my life, guys, it was about a six-month battle after I got saved. Have you ever woke up of a morning and not felt saved? Maybe you didn't sleep just right. Your neck doesn't want to straighten up. And, and you wake up a bit about on the half crank, you know. I've got some real good advice for that. If you can't get out of bed on the right side, get back in bed. Stay in bed till you can get on the right side. Because if you come out half cranky, you'll be way up in the afternoon before you can try to shake it. It'll wreck your morning bigger than Dallas. Your quiet time just went out the window. It's not going to make sense what you're reading on the page because you just don't want it to. And if you asked me if I'm saved that day, you'd probably say, I don't know. kind of hope so because I'm not having my better day. To be sure. To have that knowledge, guys. Past the feelings. It's not the feelings that bring the sureness. It's the sureness that bring the feelings. And I can rejoice in, in something that I didn't even ask for. I, can you remember before you were saved, some of you down the road a little bit? I know, I think you said you were th 39 years old before you trusted Jesus, and, and you're just going down the road, minding your own business like a TSC. And the Lord says, hey, buckaroo, come here to me. Well, that would be that election stuff. That would be that calling stuff. And all of a sudden, come here to me. Boop. And I did. And salvation ensued. All of a sudden, I was something I didn't even know I needed. Now, that's the simplicity of the, of the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God. I always love to say this when I talk like this because I said somebody comes up to me and said, Pastor, you're, you're going to be really excited. I, and they said, I found Jesus. And I said, I'm excited because I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> I'm trying to quit some of that stuff, okay? Um, I just like to hug their neck and tell them how proud I am of them. But the truth of Scripture is that he came and got me one day. And about six months later, I, I fussing back and forth with him because I woke up too many times with that. However I went to bed is how I woke up. And sometimes I went to bed with a load on my mind and business and all that stuff, you know, and somebody wronged me and they didn't pay me and that's it, I'm getting them and, you know, all the stuff you go to bed with sometimes. And woke up with the very same thing. And all of a sudden... About six months down the road, and I've not heard the audible voice of God, and I say this lovingly, unless it was my wife telling me something, and, and, and I agreed. So, and she's never been wrong. That's what scares me. <laughs> if she'll stand up on, on me like that, she's never been wrong. And so I'm, I'm not bowing, but I'm thanking you for paying attention because sometimes I don't. But I heard. I heard. In my spirit, as it was an audible voice, and this simple for me, it said, you're okay. Now will you go to work? And I said, yes, sir. And I'm not turned back. But it took me about six months reading a bunch. I had people tell me, read this, read that, and I got a whole list in the front of my Bible on, on assurance verses and and I'd read them, and I said, well, that can't possibly be right. You could flip me and pitch me and do what you want. He said, why would you say that? Because I didn't have the knowledge of who he was. Knowledge. Knowledge of who God was. And you can flip and flop around on this stuff all you want, but I'm telling you, 
when it comes to the knowledge of truth. And once there you say, it's Jesus is my salvation. I was, I was called. I was sealed. And I'm soon to be delivered in the name above all names. Now you say, well, pastor, that's just old school teaching. Well, do you know? Do you know you're saved? Keep it to yourself. Don't say it this time. That game was over. You don't have to holler. Keep it to yourselves. Another one. That's number one. I'm going to give you three that I just picked. Do you know the love of God? Do you know that that can never be taken back? Joe likes the way I say things. Do you know that God cannot not love you? Did you figure that one out? God cannot not love you. You know how I know that? If Jim was to stand up, there's a big numbers on his shirt, 3 dot dot 16. He's already proven to me that his love is real. How? Jesus. For God so? Okay. Good. He's already made that fact perfectly clear. And he cannot, will not come backwards on it. Well, some of you say, and I've heard you tell me this, not you guys so much, but I've heard you tell, well, God doesn't love me anymore. And I said, I wonder why you'd say that. I wonder why you'd say that. Well, and there's usually a story that goes with it. And I, and I tell them my woodshed story. Now, you guys, some of you have got enough age on you to know what, what it meant when, when you got taken to the woodshed. You weren't looking for kindling. In fact, you were hoping there was none there that could be used against you. <laughs> I don't have a problem going to the woodshed. It, it, let me ask you a question. When the Lord takes you to the woodshed in a disciplinary manner, does he do it because he doesn't love you? Or because he loves you so much that he's going to straighten your little course up? You're not going to go that way. You're not going to go that way. He's going to make sure that you're not going to go that way, and you can fuss all you want. But did he do it? Does he do it? Because he doesn't love you. So if you're going to tell me that God doesn't love you anymore, and I said, you know, you may want to check that out a little bit. And I can, and I can be nice, and I walk through him. I said, well, how's your study of a morning? And I haven't read the Bible in two years. That'll do it. You're cold, ice cold. Went to church? Ah, that pastor, he's a goofball. I don't go in there. Make all the excuses. Guys, come on. We know what they all are. We've heard them over and over. I pray we haven't used too many of them. But they're there to be used if you want them. And what it'll do, it'll cause you to realize that you may not have a pertinent, hot, loving relationship with the God who saved you. So you've already told me you know you're saved. Do you know you're loved? Without a doubt. Never to be taken. How about a third one? Do you know that his divine power, now start to get into Second Timothy, uh, Second uh, Peter with me here. Do you know verse 3 of Second Peter? It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for the life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Do you see that? One verse. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that you got no excuse? Well, let me put it this way. I have no excuse. You can lay that one on you. I'm not here to tell you about you. I'm here to tell you what Scripture's talking about. When you have divine power for everything we need for life and godliness, if you know God, you know that that's true. And so that's just the third one. I picked these three because I wanted to keep it simple. And you said, come on, Pastor, these are, these are just so elementary. Well, I'm going to tell you something. These are your base truths. Because what I'm going to take you to is seven 
building blocks, I'm going to call them. I'm going to take you to seven one-somethings that you're going to install in your life when you know that this base is, is absolutely true. His divine power. Is that like perfect? Because I'm going to get you to a statement here, and I'm going to say that you can participate in his divine nature. And some of you, and maybe all of us at one time or another, has kind of run from that because, oh, 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 that divine nature, and that's God, and he's yonder. If your God is yonder, you better go back to those first three that I was talking about and check in. Your God is not yonder. By the way, at salvation, who came to indwell? If it wasn't divine nature in the form of the third person of the Trinity, Holy Spirit. So if you think you're out here hanging this one on your own, you, you could be a little bit off like way. At that salvation point, that foundational salvation point, you received divine nature, divine presence, if you will. Who do you think put that guy at TSC against me at TSC to talk about election? Who do you think did that? Divine appointment. Family, I, th th there's a chance we could miss that. I could have grinned at him and walked off and done what it, I could have done a lot of things. He could have kept quiet. He walked away from the cash register and caught me on the way out the door. Hey, who does that? Come on, divine power. I call it a divine appointment. I refuse. I, I want to stay so, so close on that. I don't want to miss that like ever again, ever in my life again. Those are the appointments that you don't set, babies, the babies of God, the children of God. You don't set those. You get those set for you. Show up. You're there. You can. It's no big deal. Don't let fear take over. You're foundational. And, and I'll, tell you why that's, I'll tell you why that's so good. The next seven things I'm going to tell you uh, have to do with the proof of our identity. The proof. Now, you may like Peter because he doesn't take a long time to say something. Peter's going to rip through this, and, and it's going to cause a guy like me uh, hours to get studied up and know what the words he means and what, he, what are you trying to say here, Pete? Of all the people you're going to read in the Bible, Paul was a hard case. Paul was zealous. Peter was just Peter. Peter had run Peter's life for so long that he didn't need anyone else. And when Jesus showed up, Peter had issues getting past Peter to get to Jesus. And even in Christ, he's still going to school up on Jesus. Peter's the one in the Bible that he said, get behind me, Satan. Now, if you were Peter, that probably hurt his feelings. Get behind me. What? Who? But Peter did some stuff, guys. Peter did some faith walking, don't you know? Peter can teach on me anytime he wants. So I watch him teaching here, and, I, and he said something that he had to learn. The divine power has given us everything he needed for a life and for that godliness in that life. He's going to refer back to that three. So circle chapter, verse 3, therefore, if you would. So I'd say, again, we must have that firm foundation. Do you know that you can't build your life on jello? I thought of that all by myself. And I love Jello, but you know you can't stack much on Jello till you don't have much stacked. So why in the world would you need a foundation that's firm? You want to see what Paul says about it? Put something in Second Peter there. Turn, turn, turn to First Corinthians with me, if you would, please, chapter three. I want to read you a little blurb here. First Corinthians chapter three. Don't lose Peter. We're coming right back. Here's how Paul says it. Put in at verse 10 with me, if you would, please. 
10 and 11 are what I want, but I'm going to read to the end because I'm going to show you who the someone is here that Paul's speaking about. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a ward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You like that? I read it too fast. Did you get a hold of some of that? Oh, the test is coming. The test is coming. It's not going to be how long can you tread water this time. It's not going to be 40 days, 40 nights raining. Scripture says fire. Scripture says fire is going to test the quality of each man's work. Did you like the last part? If what he has is burned up, and sad to say that, sad to say, that some will hit, if there are gates, some will hit the gates of heaven with nothing but the slab, nothing but the foundation. I've told you guys over and over, your pastor wants to get good at this Christian stuff before he gets to go home. I want to hit there with a house standing. He's got to open the gates wide to let me in. And I'm not being goofy. But when I get there, I want to have something to show that I was here. And I found it today. And I think you're going to like it. And, and, and when you see it, when you see it like this, Paul says the foundation is Christ. I said that earlier. Paul says the someone is going to build on it. Can I tell you who the someone is here today? Row by row, seat by seat, you just became a someone when you trusted Jesus. You've been given some stuff up front. Your foundation is firm. Your divine power is in place. Your love is solid. Guess whose turn it is? He who builds. Are you back in Second Peter with me? To build a life worthy of our calling? Family, our witness may not need words. It just may not need words. I think it's privileged if you get to say something. But you witness going down the road, people just watch you. And they, uh, for some reason, they just know who you are. Your life will say it all. So, you ready for the seven? Now look what he says. You, in Second Peter with me, chapter 1. Let's put it in at 4, just not to leave a gap. Therefore, these... He has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Have you, have you ever thought that you could participate in divine nature? You, 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 yeah, you may not have thought about it. Do you know in Christ that you're participating in divine nature? Because you are not who you were born as. You've been saved. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The, come on. You know all these verses. You've read them a bunch. You've seen them played out. And you know them. You know them. And now he's going to teach you something. Look at he split. You're going to get it. And here it goes like this. I'm just going to read all the way. Then I'll back up and, and give you some insight in it that I got. For this very reason, make every effort, for this very reason, the fact that you're in, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Stop. That was the teaching. So, 
if you'll allow me to, to say it like this, if you remember when you were kids, remember the building blocks? Sure you do. You used to build things. Guys, I know you did. Little girls, if nothing else, you came and kicked them down when your brother had them built. I knew how it worked. And you would build them up, and, and, and you found out some very good truth. If you didn't set them just right, they didn't stand very long because somebody would come by and bump the table. I started to look for some. I don't have any anymore. But you can picture this. you got seven blocks if you will. Let me change it to that. There's seven things that are going here. And, and the very first thing that it says, and from our knowing, by the way, the very first thing that he says, add this to your faith. Would you allow me to mess with you a little bit? No, yeah, Terry, you got to. I got the microphone. <laughs> Refer back to verse 1 in Second Peter chapter 1. Whose faith is it? Whose faith are you going to add to? Now, now, just look at it for a minute. Do you know before the Lord called me into his kingdom, I had no clue who he was. I was lost in sin. Now, go to class on this and, and make sure you understand what I'm talking about. It says the faith that you received equal to Peter's. So the faith that I have was given me by God, and he says, now build on it. The faith, if you will, is your foundation. That's your solid life, is your faith. You have faith in what is the truth of who God is, of what you know. And not what, you don't have faith in what you know. You have faith in the what you know, that God is. Did I goof it up? Faith. Given to you by God, according to Peter, in verse 1. So now we're going to add, and we're going to add seven things to it. And it's going to go like this. The first one, you think, well, what in the world? Well, watch this. Do you know the difference between the Christian and the non? Is faith. The God-given received faith from God. And that's just the way it said it. So, it says goodness. First block that you have is goodness. Here's your foundation. Here's your block. And you're going to add to the faith that you have. Your saving faith, your grace, mercy, to the love. You're going to take the power that is yours to place the goodness block in your life. And we'll say, what does that mean? Well, he didn't open it up right here, but what it is in this, when you take it and do a study on this, it's called moral excellence. Have you ever, you know what morality is. Morality is when you have a choice between right and wrong and you choose right. Moral, moral excellence is living rightly, right. And that's what it is. So, uh, and it has to do with our behavior, the right and wrong in our life. And, when, and if, you, if, you have, if you get to that, and, and I'm wanting to grow past it to pick. Let's see. Let's see. Hmm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. There is no picking. There's a direction I'm called to. And I'm not going to tell you that I don't come off the trail anymore, you know. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you I don't like me when I do. But I'm going to tell you what, when you're morally excellent, you are picking right every time. No wiggle room in that, family. There's no wiggle room to be good. And then it said to that uh, goodness, you add knowledge. Uh -huh. This is not smarts. Some of you are right at brilliant. IQ'd up there somewhere. I don't want to know about that so much as I want to know what you know. The spiritual knowledge of the, of the indwelling spirit that has set things solid in your life. I know what I know. And in that, you will find out that you, uh, <laughs> through the Holy Spirit, that you focus on him. And, and a big part of him is his word. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so anytime you and I pick this up, I know what it's written in a lot of different translations. I read NIV because I don't read Hebrew and Greek. And I'm good with that. But off of this page right here, this just, just blew me up. I never thought about the divine nature. I never thought about some of this stuff like it said. And so I'm going down the road. I said, now what I need is I acknowledge to my goodness so my moral direction, my moral compass is always headed right. And now I add to what I know about God to that. And then I get to the self-control. And it started now. We're going to see why those two are first. Oh, by the way, I do believe these are all in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, to add to those two, I had better add self-control. Our practice must be led by self-control. Our life must be led. Oh, have you ever thought how many passions there are out there that are available today? You can't watch TV without getting a passion thrown on you. A way of doing things, of living your life. Well, you better have some self-control, and that block better be put in place. This is a full-time, big-time focus. And then it says you need some perseverance, and oh, my, if number four isn't a good one to be perseverance. Now, what you do with that is it's... Um, Hmm. With all that can pull you and I away, for you and I to stay the course and, and walk the walk, how they say, and put into practice, uh, we got to hold firm all the way to His glory on what we know is right. You know the pressures of the world just as well as I do. It's nothing new. I've only been 40 years out of a life of sin, full time. Only 40. I wish, I, I do have, I do forget things, but I wish I could forget some of that, and I, this never goes away. Listen, family, this is where I get to my great advice for you, my good counsel, two words. Sometimes in perseverance, you just got to stop it. You just got to stop it. Not hope you can get around it. Not wish it would go away on its own. You don't need me to call me to pray with you, and I don't need to call you. I just need to stop it. You see, that block, that perseverance block, is my block to set in place. And I must stop it. And then number five said godliness. Ooh. Now about this time, you're starting to add to your life and you're starting to, you're starting to get things going and maturing up in the Christian world and, 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 and you're speaking with authority. Um, and I don't mean to boss over. I mean authority that you know what you're talking about. And, and then you get into godliness. And this is where it, this is where it's, it gets sweet, guys. Because if you don't keep God in the windshield... And you let him get to the rearview mirror, you're not going to have the reverence you need for Almighty God. The Savior of your soul. You're going to think, I got it now. Any of you ever heard that San Francisco parking story? You need this. It'll break it up a little bit for you. I've been there. You ever been in the middle of San Francisco? You can't see the top of the buildings. I would like to get to the top of the buildings because what I see on the street, I don't even want to get out of my car, and I'm semi sort of fearless, and I'm not packing. And so when it gets down to it, I'm driving down there, and the buildings are so tall, so tall. That's probably the Lord calling somebody. So tall that my brand-new GPS goes out. Uh, no reception, no satellite service. I went, no. And so when the GPS goes out, you start praying, because what do you have after that? <laughs> and so you're, you're looping, and you're looping, and you're looping, and, and you're saying, oh, Lord, I'm late for a meeting. I'm supposed to be there, and they're paying me big, and, and I got the stuff that they need to hear. And, and you're looping, and you're looping, and you say, oh, Lord, I got to have a parking place. 
and you come around again, wham, here a guy comes out. You say, never mind, I got one. Did you get it? You see, I didn't give God the glory. I prayed up and I said, Lord, Lord, I got to have a parking place. Never mind, I got one. That guy just pulled out. <laughs> it would be funny if it wasn't so true. <laughs> give God the glory. Have that reverence. Know who he is and let him be who he is. And it all gets so sweet. Do you know that you and I have an obligation? Do you like that word? You're obligated to follow the one who called you. Obligated. It's not a negotiation. You're called to follow. Now, if you play rough with yourself like I do, it gets pretty clear. I hope you don't mind getting played rough with, but let me tell you what, you don't have a choice, buckaroo and buckarooette. You don't have a choice. You're obligated to get in line and follow. And he's the leading. So these five are you and I on the inside. Nobody sees those. This is where we truly live, guys. We live on the inside and we work it to the outside, right? Before I can get to do number six and seven, I had better have one, two, three, four, five set in place, foundationally secure, because when I get to six, it says brotherly kindness. Did you see it switch? It went from the inside to the outside. Your concern for others, care, is past your concern for you. Now, the typical thing is, you know, to help the lady across the street. Um, if she's loaded down, take some of it if she'll let you. You don't mug her to get to help her. You just <laughs> but you just help brotherly kindness. You go out of your way to help someone else. Maybe there's not even a thank you. Does it matter? That's not what brotherly kindness is about. Brotherly kindness is about the service that you have for someone else. You served yourself all these years. And brotherly kindness is number six. And then, oh, I tell you, number seven says it all. And on top of the brotherly kindness, don't forget love. What started with faith in a Christian will be seen in love. And love... I defined this years ago for me because I had trouble with this. I'd love you as long as I got what I wanted in return. I was actually professional grade at it, and um, I learned what love was. For me to love correctly, I want the best for you no matter what it costs me. You know where I learned that? I watched my heavenly father let his son go to the cross. For me, for God the Father to love me, he did it, and no matter what it cost him, and he watched Jesus go to the cross. And I thought, wow. So I say it like this, and some of you are going to get on me a little bit maybe, but you know, most of the people that I love, I don't like. I got a whole bunch of people that I send the love of God to them, and I'll tell you what, I'm not fishing with them until the love of God sets on them, straights them out, and then we can be buds. They're cutting the heads off of our brothers and sisters around the world. The persecution is hot and heavy around the world. I don't like that. I don't like those people. But for me to love, biblically love correctly, I have to pray for them. And so how I pray for them legitimately in love is that I pray God's best to them. Do you know what God's best to them would be? Wouldn't it be salvation? Wouldn't it be Jesus? So when they know Jesus, then, then my prayer, oh, I want my prayer answered. I'd like my brothers and sisters to quit losing their head, but... but 
I'm proud of them that they have the perseverance and the self-control and all the stuff and, and, and to hold their ground. They just beat me home. So you can play it any way you want to play it. And it sounds kind of wrong when I tell you most of the people that I love, I don't like at all. But I'll love them in person when they can turn and find Jesus. But I can send the love to them in my prayers. And my prayers are legitimate. I don't have a problem praying in love and wanting it to be true. Wow. Do you know what the world sees in you and I? They see the love. Now, guys, we don't usually run around talking like that. I love you, man. But what the world sees is do we love. Do we love? And the last two things, of course, are on the outside. And your brotherly kindness, and, and why'd you do it? Did you do it to get yourself a kudo? Or did you do it out of the love that God put in you to be of service? So here's your questions. Here's your blocks. This is all there is. And so what started with the faith is going to end with the love. The lesson from Peter is how to build a power down Christian life that will let us be, and I read it to you, effective and productive. That's it. There's your punchline. My life, built correctly, will be effective and productive. God style. God style. So let me shut it down with this. It goes like this. If you look at verse 10 and 11, our guarantee and our reward. Go back to verse 10 with me there. Therefore, my brother, be all the more eager to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. Doesn't it say? If you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 10 and 11. Ron said I cheated him in Sunday school. Ron, I just read 10 and 11 for you. You want to know what you get by building your blocks correctly? A rich reward when you get there. you got a choice. Do you want to go in foundation only? Or do you want to go in with the mansion that you've built in your life? By divine power, in love, correctly built, monitored daily, moment by moment, we grow to his glory. We grow to his glory, and that's for sure. Effective and productive. So, you need some homework. Next week, it's going to be potluck. I have not come up with a book or chapter one because I got so wound up in this, I forgot to pay attention. I'll surprise you. I'd read the whole New Testament if I were you <laughs> to be ready for me. Divine nature. You tell me, when you take these seven, that this is not the divine nature. This is the personification of God for sure. And then he says, I'm going to let you participate with me. You want divine nature? Seven of them right there. That's God blown up. Big screen. You want to participate? Come on. The foundation is poured. I think Peter nailed it. I was proud to help him out and explain a couple words to me, so I just gave them to you too. God personified seven ways. Don't weaken, brethren. Watch what he does. Let's pray. How about singing a song? Depart from the day and make this look like not church. Get ready for 61 children coming tomorrow in a vacation Bible school. Jojo, you're on, big dog. They're getting ready and set, and we're going to have a word of prayer. And, and uh, listen, guys, if there's any of this that, that I goofed up by saying it wrong, I'll have coffee with you while they're moving the chairs. You didn't get that, did you?
and explain it all to you again. This is good stuff. This is rich stuff. This is real deal living down the road, feet on the ground, shining like the stars we're called to be. Let's pray. And Father, I do pray that if anybody here that's not sure they know you, that, wow, Father, they can see what's in you, and, and if they hear your call, they'll come, Lord. So I pray you put that call and that election on them, and I, I don't know who's here, and I don't know what hearts are hearts, Father, but I'll tell you what, each one of us can get a lesson from this today, and that's for sure. So, Lord, I ask now as you settle our hearts, and we got this one song to go, and and Father, if there's any questions or any decision and they need to see a pastor, they've got one right before them. they got a neighbor that if they know the Lord Jesus as Savior, then they can go at it and, and uh, pray with them and be with them. But Father, to you be the glory through this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Peter that puts your word to paper. The life that he lived and the struggles that he had, Father, if I could glean just one struggle less than he had, I'd be pleased. And Father, help me to, to trust and to count on and add to the faith that you've already given me in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. How about standing? How about one more song? All right. You all know this one. Make sure you help me out.
And that will be our excitement when we get there. Hallelujah. Father, bless us up now with traveling mercies, that's for sure. But let us, uh, let us rearrange this church and be safe doing it. And Father, let us have some sweet fellowship over a cup of coffee or whatever's out there. And Father, let us just be glad in our heart for you. Lord, I know you touch us. I know how it works, and I thank you for it. Our blessing comes from you, and we look for it daily in Jesus' precious name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.